All right, guys, now that we've learned the basics of limits, we're going to start to look at some that are just a little bit more uh, difficult. And it's not that they're that much harder, it's just they're going to require a couple new strategies that we haven't seen in a little while. Um, so, example, if you look at this first one, there's no numbers. That's what gets us a little bit confused. But we just need to look at what it's asking us. It's asking us to find the limit as h approaches 0. Okay, so what that means is it's okay for there to be x's in my final answer. And we're actually going to see limits that look like this a lot more later on. Um, but for right now, just know that this means that we're only going to replace the h's with 0. And if I did that from the start, if I went ahead and replaced those with 0, I would get x squared minus x squared, which is 0 over 0. And we know 0 over 0 doesn't work. That means I need to do something to change this equation. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to multiply that top part of this fraction out. So I know x plus h squared turns into x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. And then I still have minus x squared, and this is all divided by h. So now I can go ahead and simplify this again. Okay, this is all just some subtraction here, so I'm going to go ahead and get rid of those parentheses. And I have x squared minus x squared. So now what I have, the top of my fraction is 2xh plus h squared all divided by h. And remember we talked about this before, if both terms at top have an h in it, then I can go ahead and divide that h. But I have to divide it out of both terms. So I can get rid of one of those h's and that h. So what I'm left with now is just 2x plus h. So now I can go ahead and plug in 0 for that h, and I get a final answer of 2x. Alright, so this next one's going to be pretty similar. Alright, it's the same kind of idea um, where I'm going to have to, if I go ahead and plug in 0, I'm going to get 0 over 0, which I know is not going to work out. Uh, so what that means is I'm going to have to do some math to work this out and to simplify the top before I can find my answer. So in the top here then, I'm going to go ahead and multiply that out. So I'm going to get 8 plus 12h plus 6h squared plus h cubed, and that's going to be minus 8. Remember, this whole thing is divided by h. And now I'm going to go ahead and start simplifying it. So I know 8 minus 8, that goes away to 0. So if I look at the terms that I have left, every one of those terms has an h. So every one of those terms can get an h canceled out. And that h at the bottom is now gone. So what I have left then is 12 plus 6h plus h squared. Now I can go ahead and plug in 0 and I get 12. Alright, the next one we're going to look at it just takes a different strategy. This is one we've actually done something like this before whenever we're working with our proofs and other things. Uh, so what we're going to need to do here, if I look again, always try to plug in that number from the start. If I take 7 and plug it in, I'm going to get 3 minus 3 over 7 minus 7. So I get 0 over 0. And remember, 0 over 0 means we don't know the answer, there's something we need to do. So what I'm going to do on this question is I'm going to multiply by the conjugate. And if you remember, the conjugate is instead of the square root of x plus 2 minus 3, we're going to do the square root of x plus 2 plus 3. And the reason we're going to do that is because now when I FOIL this out, those middle terms there will cancel out. So when I multiply this out at the top, I'll just have the square root of x plus 2 times the square root of x plus 2, which is just x plus 2 minus 9. And then at the bottom, I'll have that x minus 7 times the conjugate. So then at the top here, I'm going to go ahead and simplify this. I get x plus 2 minus 9 is the same thing as x minus 7 
and those x minus sevens now can cancel out. So what I'm left with is one divided by the square root of x plus two plus three. Now I can go and I can take that seven and plug it in. So I get one over the square root of nine plus three, which is one over three plus three, which is one over six. All right, then the next one again, I'm gonna have to do something a little bit different. So what I'm gonna do in this one is I have fractions. So what I'm gonna to need to do is take those fractions and combine them together. So I'm gonna look at the top and I'm gonna get a common denominator in order to add these together. And again, remember first, always try to plug in that negative four. Plug in the negative four, I get zero over zero. It doesn't work. So I'm gonna combine those top two fractions by getting a common denominator. That means this right fraction is gonna get multiplied by four over four. The left fraction is going to get multiplied by x over x. So what that's going to give me is x over 4x plus 4 over 4x. I'll divide it by 4 plus x. And I'm going to combine those top two fractions together now. So I get x plus 4 over 4x. And this whole thing is divided by 4 plus x. So I'm going to rewrite this. This is x plus 4 over 4x divided by 4 plus x over 1. And we know when we divide fractions, I just flip the second and multiply. And now you guys can see if I multiply this out, those x plus 4 is going to cancel out. And all I'm left with is 1 over 4x. Now I can take that negative 4 and plug it in, and I get my limit, which is negative 1 over 16. All right, now the last ones we're going to look at are a little bit new. These are going to be piecewise functions. Okay, so you learn about piecewise functions in Algebra 2. That's where your graph is a certain type of function in one place and a different kind of function somewhere else. So to help you see this a little bit better, I'm going to go ahead and draw this graph at the top. So what this graph is, it's the function 2x minus 2, which I'm going to go ahead and graph. That's a y-intercept of negative 2 and a slope of 2 everywhere except for where this graph is equal to 1. So when this graph is equal to 1, I'm actually at the point 8. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a closed circle at the point 1, 8 but for the rest, and then an open circle where this graph would cross one. So my graph would look like this. Now we're gonna to try to answer these questions. The first one is actually to evaluate this graph when x actually equals one. And that's just given to us. That's what the closed circle is. This function actually equals, when this function has an x value of one, the y value is eight. So now we're gonna look at the limit as x approaches zero. Okay, so the limit as x approaches 0 is, as my x's approach that value, I can see that my y values are approaching 2. And the last one is a little bit tricky. Okay, so that's the limit as x approaches 1. So by looking at my graph, again, I'm looking for the limit. Okay, so I'm looking for as my x's approach 1, not when they actually, just what they are approaching. And what they are approaching is that open circle where that point would be. So even though it's not a closed circle, that's still what my graph is approaching as it gets closer and closer and closer. So that limit is zero. All right, now we've got one more. And for this one, I'm not gonna draw the graph. We're just gonna kind of look at this and think about it. So I've got three different functions in three different places. I've got everything from the left of negative two is one function. I've got everything in between negative two and one. And then I've got everything greater than one. So the first limit it's asking me to find is the limit as x approaches negative 2. So as I approach negative 2, you can see my graph is doing two different things. When it's less than, okay, so from the left side, as I approach negative 2, I'm going to look at this top function. So as everything that's less than negative 2, I can see that y value is 2. Now I'm going to look at the right side of my graph. So the right side of my graph is everywhere where x is greater than negative 2. So when x is greater than negative 2, I'm looking at the function 2x plus 4. So in order to find what that limit is, I'm going to take negative 2 and actually plug that in. 
and I get a value of 0. And then we talked about this yesterday, how there were three cases where our limit didn't exist, and one of those cases is when my left side and my right side are doing two different things. So because my left side and right side are doing two different things, I can say that limit as x approaches negative 2 does not exist. All right, so then the last one we're going to look at is my limit as x approaches 1. And again, there's two parts of this graph where x approaches 1. Everything on the right side is when x is greater. So on the right side, I'm going to look at use 6x for my function. Then on the left side, when x is less than 1, I'm going to use this function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in 1 to both of those points. So if I plug it into the top function, I get 6. Plug it in the bottom function, I also get 6. So since those values are the same, both sides of my equation are approaching the same value. I can find that limit, and that limit is 6.